four or five years, I think. As the first wildlife ecologist for the Presidio National Park, Jonathan has one of the coolest jobs in the Bay Area. He and his Presidio Trust team are involved in one of the greatest experiments of urban ecological restoration going on today. Jonathan has a Master of Arts with a focus on urban amphibian conservation. Master of Science. Ecology. He has been at the forefront of the urban coyote tracking program, is very involved in the highly successful restoration of Mountain Lake, as well as the revival of numerous threatened, extirpated, and endangered species. Jonathan, thanks so much for being with us today. Take it away, man. Yeah, thanks Eddie for the intro. <clears throat> thanks California Native Plant Society for the invite. And the special shout out goes to uh, Jake Sig for um, uh, extending this invite originally. I gave this talk in the early part of this year and Jake was uh, in the audience. And um, of course, things have changed drastically since late February. And uh, here we are now. I, I see you all out in the ether world. I, I think there's about 100 or so folks out there. Um, thanks for joining. And <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit more about my role. Uh, Eddie gave some background, and I'm going to get into that in a little bit. Uh, but before I do, there's a couple steps I want to go through. And really, before we start digging into the meat of my role in the Presidio and the wildlife of the Presidio, um, I, it's really important to put some context to this concept that Eddie was getting at um, in terms of this kind of 21st century idea of nature in the cities. Uh, nature has always kind of been uh, ignored in urban areas, and I'll talk more about that. But first, I want to put some context to that. And before I put some context into that, I just want to do uh, show a couple images and I just want you to, to just let them flow over you and just kind of feel, feel what you feel. Let me just see if this uh, PowerPoint wants to work. There we go. We're seeing it, man. Perfect. Serenity now. <clears throat> so, you know, this is really, a lot of what I'm going to say is preaching to the choir from a California native plant enthusiast. For those of you who are part of this society, obviously we understand the value of natural places like this, and even more so in today's age with this lockdown and all that stuff. Um, but fewer and fewer people are privileged enough to actually see and experience this in person. And um, our urban populations are growing, of course, no surprise. This is a, an image that to, to give you an idea, 1950, if you look at the colored dots, the size of the circle represents roughly the, the, the index of the size of the population and the color represents the percent growth. So are they growing a lot? So 1950 compared to 2020, and you can see these urban areas are really spiking more people are living in urban areas than they are in rural areas. And that 50 percentile, pat, we surpassed that in the mid 2000s. And that trend is continuing to grow. So more and more people are living in these urban areas and less and less people are priv privileged enough to actually be able to experience uh, primitive nature on a grand large scale like the Grand Canyon. <clears throat> and in a lot of Urbanite's eyes, real nature, real, air quotes over real, is, is, is out there. It's far and away, it's separate, it's something else. It's not relevant to me here in my concrete jungle. I don't know about it, I don't care about it. That's the reality that we're living in and that trend is only increasing. Urban nature, some of, if we're lucky enough, we might have a vacant lot to go explore, but generally urban nature is uninspiring, unkempt, unsafe, and unhealthy. Fewer and fewer kids are exploring and connecting in nature, but are instead spending more time in front of the screen, 
And a lot of folks are now calling this nature deficit disorder, which again is that disconnect from the natural world. And that's, that's pretty significant when you think about the long-term effects of that in terms of uh, environmental policy and conservation. Why would somebody support something that they don't know about and they really don't care about? Why, it's not relevant to them. Why would they support something like that? And of course, science these days, we've all been hearing this over the last several years. Um, it, science is showing the importance of nature for not only our physical health, but also our mental health. And um, especially now with these lockdowns, this couldn't be more poignant right now. And at least up here in the Bay Area, we got the lockdowns. And then on top of that, we have these this air quality issues. So now we're even double lockdown, even going outside these days over the last couple of weeks has been a real challenge for our health. Um, and a lot of us, I'm sure, are sitting in our homes just itching to get outside, even to those, those hilltops of San Francisco, which are a godsend in times like this. And we all know, of course, nature provides, um, has a lot of benefits, can have a lot of benefits, and, and what we would call ecosystem services. So functions of the natural world that provide tangible benefits to human beings, such as clean, clear water. That's one of the most obvious examples that most anybody and everybody can truly understand the difference between a cesspool and crystal clear drinkable water. That, that is the difference between an unhealthy ecosystem and a healthy ecosystem. And I'm gonna get into many more examples of ecosystem services specific to the Presidio. Um, so I wanna hone in a little bit on our beautiful city of Yerba Buena, AKA San Francisco, and just kind of highlight some of the changes that have been happening um, since the beginning of really the uh, European arrival in San Francisco. And of course, um, the Ohlone were here for millennia doing a number of different types of land management strategies, but really significant change started around the gold rush era. And uh, this is actually a picture of Golden Gate Park being created. And in the distance, you can see San Francisco, as a lot of us know, was primarily covered in dunes. So I'm just gonna kind of scroll through just images of these lost landscapes, San Francisco, Cliff House looking out of the dunes, Lake Merced, the Great Sand Waste, 70 plus percent of San Francisco would have looked something like this, Coal Valley, Mountain Lake, Presidio. Again, this is the, the, the uh, twilight era of the Great Sand Waste. This is a, an aerial from the 1930s uh, over current sunset. And this is one of the earliest photos, or excuse me, not photos, um, images that, that I am aware of, and so I would love for somebody to correct me, but 1816, this is the main post of the Presidio looking out the Golden Gate, and that's the Marin Headlands in the background. And obviously, a lot has changed since then. Uh, it's no surprise at all. Uh, a lot was lost due to development. And of course, the Bay Area is still recognized as an international biodiversity hotspot um, with a lot of endemic species. So for those of you who don't know endemic, endemic, they only occur in this area and nowhere else in the world. They are endemic to this area, but a lot has been lost over the centuries of development. And one example in San Francisco, this is the Xerxes blue butterfly. First American butterfly known to go extinct due to humans. 1940s, it was last seen in the Presidio, in the dunes. And as I said earlier, San Francisco was primarily covered with dunes. This butterfly probably would have been flying all over San Francisco. Those dunes were lost. The host plant of this butterfly is lost and we lost the butterfly. It is extinct from the face of the earth. Along with the Xerxes blue, California quail. Uh, I believe there might be one individual left in Golden Gate Park, but uh, you can't have a sustainable population with one individual. So they are functionally extinct in this city. That happened around the early 2000s. And, uh, Sad to say, they're, they're actually the city bird, which is sad because <laughs> they're extinct from the city. And um, they're also the state bird as well. Um, and uh, a lot of these were quail and, and all these other species were lost, primarily due to the loss of habitat. Um, many other species were certainly lost and I'll talk more about that. And probably species that were never described to science. So things that might be gone forever and we just never will know about. So zooming in a little bit more, uh, this is the Presidio. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, but just to give you some context, that's the Golden Gate Bridge. We are looking south, and that is the Presidio. It is a 1,500-acre national park, and uh, this is where I'm going to focus the talk for the rest of the night. 
the Presidio is a former military base founded in 1776. Once again, we're looking out the Golden Gate right there. That's the Marin Headlands in the back. And this, I believe, is the Presidio Boulevard Gate. Um, and Lovers, you can see Lovers Lane shooting down the center. That's the main post down there. This is at the very early stages of the eucalyptus plantations, I believe. You can see some of them up there. Uh, founded by the Spanish, then went through the Mexican government, and then uh, around the gold rush, 1849, the United States military came in and took over. Mid-1990s, the Presidio became a national park. Military bases across the country started to get shut down, and the Presidio was designated as uh, no longer strategically important. So it was instead transferred over to the National Park Service under a, a whole variety of controversial things that I won't get into. Um, and essentially the, the federal mandate around this is to manage and maintain not only the natural history, which of course that's what I'm talking about and what I work with, but also the cultural history. Uh, so all of the buildings, all the military buildings from the 1770s all the way up until uh, 1970s, 80s, and 90s. Those are all federally protected, including the natural resources. And so the Presidio Trust actually is the federal agency that manages about 80% of the interior. So the majority of the Presidio, the coastal areas are still managed by the National Park Service. And this Presidio is, uh, I see it as the core of the larger Golden Gate National Recreation Area that spans from Marin County, San Francisco County, down into San Mateo County. And th that's all managed by the National Park Service. So very close partners of ours. And of course the military did a number on the landscape. Um, most of their waste was not exported. A lot of it was kept on site, buried in landfills. Um, and even some of those were, were toxic, including toxic weapons, um, chemical weapons. A lot of unexploded ordinances are still being found in our project sites. We're still digging up grenades and bullets and um, weird, things that never exploded, mustard gas canisters, you know, things like that. The military, they didn't, they didn't export all that stuff. They just buried it. Uh, dilapidated buildings that the Presidio Trust is beginning to, has been restoring since the 90s. Um, but the military's presence was actually a double-edged sword. On one hand, they, they really trashed, literally, trashed the landscape. But on the other hand, their presence there actually prevented a lot of development from actually happening. And because of that, we actually have a tremendous amount of remnant historic landscape habitat, plants and animals that would have been in these areas for millennia before this. And um, had the military not been there, the, the Seacliff neighborhoods, the Richmond, the Pacific Heights neighborhoods, it, it would have just kind of blended in all the way up. Because you can imagine the very tip of the San Francisco Peninsula, that real estate is primetime real estate. But the military, that prevented the complete loss of all of that. So a real, a real treasure. Um, again, the mid-1990s, the Presidio Trust came in and part of the, the, the federal mandate is to protect and enhance the natural resources. And of course, being a fresh federal agency, there is no way the Presidio Trust had the staff to manage and, and restore all of the acreage of these natural areas. And so we really relied heavily on volunteers and still do. Uh, for restoration. So before I get into restoration, I really want to define restoration. And really, I want to start with defining what restoration, in my opinion, is not. Restoration is not recreating the past. Recreating the past is not functionally possible. It's just not possible for many different cultural reasons and natural reasons and, and all of the intricacies and complexities of the Presidio. It's not possible. What we do is we want to restore ecological health and function. And I'm gonna talk more about specifically what that is, but using past conditions and past information to inform and guide the future potential. What was this place? What is this place? And what can this place be given the con constraints of the reality of the present? So setting some of these goals, we want to sustain and increase native plants and animals. We want to improve ecosystem health and function. And we want to promote ecosystem complexity. Complexity equals resilience. Resilience allows these systems to sustain through time throughout different types of disturbances, such as drastic changing climates, for example. Complexity, you can think of complexity in ecosystems as checks and balances. The more checks and balances there are, 
the more sustainable ecosystems are through time. Um, so a lot of our work there in the Presidio is addressing the issues that are threatening those goals and understanding those issues and addressing them through management actions, applied management, essentially taking the knowledge that science has given us through research and applying it to the real world to achieve our goals against sustaining native plants and animals and improving ecosystem health and function. And I can't stress this enough, volunteers are key. None of what I'm gonna talk about tonight would be possible without volunteers. So the early days of the Presidio, again, mid to late 90s, there really wasn't a wildlife dedicated staff member. It was primarily focusing on the restoring and managing the foundations of the ecosystem. So really the vegetation, that was kind of the, the biggest thing, but also including the, the, the abiotic, the non-living components of the ecosystem. So the soils and the water systems. And uh, I wanna show you this time-lapse example here. I'm sure some of you have seen this before. Um, but this is an example of a stream daylighting that occurred in 2007. And, and I just want to highlight right now, basically what we're looking at here is a field, obviously, a pretty simple field, not much going on, mostly weeds, grass, whatever. We're looking north to our left is uh, would be Chrissy Field and the bay just right over there. And underneath this field is actually what used to be a stream that was put into a pipe by the military. I'm not sure the exact year, but a long time ago. And I, I believe, if I remember correctly, this was actually filled in to, to be a uh, shooting range. So just a flat, generic field, but there was a stream under there just in a pipe. So um, again, 20, uh, this 2007, and I'm going to hit this play button. And this is the process of daylighting a stream. So coming in, contouring this out, digging it up. You'll see where the pipe was removed, contouring the meandering of the stream planting this with native vegetation, riparian vegetation, so willows mostly. And again, this is through time beginning in 2007. And you can see a complexity of this ecosystem is really changing, right? So obviously the, the water's there now for accessible to wildlife. Not just that, but the structure, the different height classes of these different types of vegetation, the density of the willows, um, you can't really see here, but the flowering, the, the native flowering plants now in the right season is, is a huge difference. I'm just going to go back one more time just to look at what it used to look like. So that to that, huge difference. And in terms of wildlife uh, value, habitat value, um, the, the, the bird diversity has just changed completely using much, many more resources here to use. So going from simple to complex, complex systems tend to be more resilient. And so that's the context that I wanted to give before I jump into my story and, and my perspective of, of wildlife in the Presidio. So um, I'll just give some a brief background of my story because I think some of it was said in the, in the bio that Eddie gave, but I am from Southern California and I moved up to the Bay around maybe 11 or 12 years ago. Uh, with an undergrad degree in biology, uh, naively thinking I could just jump right into a cool science job with my degree, uh, learn the hard way. That was right at the beginning of the Great Recession. <laughs> Not easy to get a job in that, that field at the time. Uh, but I found an internship with the National Park Service. Michael Chasse, if you're listening, thank you. And um, that led me to other internships in the Presidio and uh, long story short, resulted in me being hired on as the first um, full-time wildlife dedicated staff of the Presidio Trust. So again, as I said, the beginning of the Presidio Trust really focused on vegetation management and kind of the abiotic non-living side like soils and waters. And so there really wasn't too much of a, of a really fleshed out wildlife program. And so that's where I came in. So started to, to really look at from that kind of second order up. So from the, the, the plants up to the animals, looking at it from that perspective and, and really trying to understand and apply wildlife management. And again, management, ecological management, specifically wildlife management is really the application of science to the real world to, in an attempt to nudge the trajectory of wildlife populations and, com and, and communities. So uh, of course, things are gonna be happening as they happen stochastically, randomly, as things come up. 
and management actions can kind of nudge things. So if a, if a population of a species is starting to decline, why is it declining? What can we do to address that and try to re reverse or change course of that trajectory of the decline? Um, and again, just to, re to reiterate the our federal mandate as a national park, uh, we need to maintain and in even increase wildlife, native wildlife diver diversity and uh, promote healthy environment a healthy environment through robust wildlife communities. So again, all of that really ties back to applied sciences and adaptive management, understanding how things are going and, 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 and adjusting our management through time as we, as we track these wildlife populations and communities. So I'm gonna get, kind of go through some of these stories and, uh, and give you some of the, the really cool uh, stories of, that are, have happened and are happening in the Presidio um, and, and really, this is kind of the, the easiest, most straightforward mantra of restoration ecology is if you build it, they will come. A lot of these wildlife species that are more mobile species like birds that can fly or insects that can fly long distances or ma larger mammals that can move long distances. Um, the reason why they were gone or barely holding on was habitat degradation or complete loss of habitat. So if you build that habitat or restore that habitat, provide the resources that they need to thrive, uh, if they can get there, they're gonna get there through time. Um, generally, that's, that's the, the easiest way to manage wildlife is restore the basis of the ecosystem, the plants, the water, and the soils. And so over the 20, first 20 years of the Presidio as a national park and the work that the trust was doing, um, habitat restoration, many species started to rebound on their own. And this is one example. This is the Western bluebird, um, which at the end of the 20th century would have been considered very rare in San Francisco. Again, just loss of habitat or very severely degraded habitat. Um, and as, as we began to restore these habitats, specifically really in the early days was Lobos Valley, which I'll have a picture later. Um, this in by 2001 we had a, a bre breeding started to spread of this species in the presidio and now we consider this this species is actually fairly common in the presidio but it, it wasn't always like that and on a similar note um, the western bluebird is what is known as a uh, secondary cavity nester and and essentially what that is is um, cavity nesters when you think of a cavity nester think of a woodpecker primary cavity nester, woodpeckers make their own cavities and they tend to focus on dead or dying trees. Secondary cavity nesters can't make their own. They don't have that, that power to, to build their own cavities. So they actually will take over old primary cavity nesters, old woodpecker nests. Here's a cool example of a really interesting example of the complexities of an urban national park. We have uh, Monterey pines, of course, we, I'm sure a lot of us know that. The, these pines weren't, wouldn't have originally been in, in the Presidio. They were brought in by the military a couple, about 100 years ago or so. And um, those pines, of course, die. And dead and dying trees are a safety problem in an urban area. So we actually have to manage those trees. But they also serve as habitat for these primary and secondary cavity nesters. But those trees have to get removed, otherwise they're going to fall on people, fall on people's property, et cetera. So this is a cool example of mitigating um, habitat loss. When those trees get removed, we actually have gone in the last couple of years after some of these tree removal projects and have installed these nest boxes in the hopes of providing that lost habitat or, or mitigating that habitat that was taken away. And you can see we've had some success here. We have a house run on the left that success, successfully uh, reared some chicks this year, which I am told that they are, their successful breeding a house run in San Francisco is uncommon. Um, and then on the right, we have some tree swallows. So um, we're, these, are, these boxes are also, we're gonna continue to spread them throughout the Presidio in the hopes of encouraging more secondary cavity nesters such as that Western bluebird we saw earlier. Um, another really cool story, um, if you build it, they will come. This is the, the green hair streak. It's about the size of a penny. I'm sure a lot of you who live in uh, San Francisco are uh, very familiar with this butterfly. Maybe you've never seen it, but I'm sure you've probably heard of it. Uh, it is a, a, a dune obligate. It, it, it requires a specific species of plant, coastal buckwheat, what we would call a host plant, 
in order to complete its life cycle. So for just, just to, to define what a host plant is for those of you who aren't familiar, butterflies have the, their life stage, as we all call a caterpillar, the larva of the butterfly, and they eat plants, they're, they're vegetarians for the most part. Um, those butterflies, and this one in particular, evolve with, over millennia, they evolve with the ability to eat and consume only specific types of plants or even specific one type of plant. In the case of this butterfly, the coast buckwheat. So when you lose habitat like the dunes of San Francisco, you lose the coast buckwheat and host plant of a butterfly like this. And if you don't have the host plant, the caterpillar has no food, there you don't have the butterfly. So without the host plant, you do not have the butterfly. Um, as we continued and began to and continued to restore the dune habitat, including a lot of the coast buckwheat throughout the Presidio, this butterfly that was hanging on just by a thread in the Presidio is now really thriving and actually starting to spread um, throughout the Presidio, throughout restored sites of the Presidio. And this tiny little penny-sized butterfly actually was able to hop from the west side of the park over Highway Pacific Coast Highway, Highway 1, over the golf course, and into a recently restored site, El Polin Valley, um, over the last couple of years, and we, we're seeing more and more of these butterflies. We built it, we restored it, and they got there on their own. The size of a penny was able to cross a very long distance of a lot of cars and a lot of golfers and all that stuff through eucalyptus forests. They got there. If you build it, they will come. Really cool example and a beautiful, striking butterfly. Another really cool thing that we're working on right now. Okay, so for those of you who are familiar with the Presidio, um, you probably have heard about this, but you can see the Golden Gate Bridge in the background. Just below that is Chrissy Marsh, which was uh, one of the original restoration sites of the Presidio in the early 2000s. Um, they took what was uh, an, a, originally a, a marsh intertidal area filled in by the military to create an, a, an airstrip, a landing field. In the, in the 90s and 2000s, National Park Service tore that up, all that asphalt, and created Chrissy Marsh. And what we're working on now in the Presidio is an extension of that. And that's what this is in the foreground right here. That is where the site is called Quartermaster Reach. And if you remember that time lapse I showed earlier uh, of that creek being day daylighted, that is actually just upstream of this Quartermaster Reach. So this is actually an area that if you were to go out there today, there's heavy equipment in this area right now, and they are currently constructing this, this area. They're digging it out, they're contouring it. This area should be done under construction um, around November of this year, and then we're gonna come in with volunteers and start to plant it with this, this these marsh, brackish uh, native plants. Um, this is a really interesting area because again, just up, just to the left of this is where the creek spills out. So you have this 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 mixing of freshwater and bay salt water. So it's a really unique habitat type that is very rare in San Francisco and in the Bay Area because all of these areas are were generally filled in because they're generally flat. They're easy to fill in. They're easy to develop. But a really cool um, wildlife component of this is uh, the native oysters. This is the Olympia oyster. And you can see these oysters here, they are actually growing on, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, but they actually attach onto structure like rocks, for example. Um, we have um, their, their planktonic uh, larvae are just floating around in the bay and use chemical sensory to actually find structure and really they're really looking for other oyster shells the uh, calcium carbonate is a signal for them to settle and grow into the oysters that we know and love and these oysters used to be abundant throughout the greater bay area um, heavily harvested in the gold rush times and of course the bay has undergone so much change whether that be uh, san francisco shoreline being fully developed and losing the majority vast majority of its hardscape its structure it's really hard structure that would go into the water is now covered up with um, buildings um, and of course invasive species have been brought in from all over the world that are impacting these these oysters and they have declined significantly um, but we're working on what we're working on in the presidio for the quartermaster reach project is actually building the structure that the, these oysters want and are looking for so these are oyster reef balls and if you look closely you can actually see that there are chunked up oyster shells. And in the far background, you can see that huge giant pile of oyster shells. Those actually came, were donated from local restaurants. So we clean, we sterilize those, we crush them up. We have these molds you can kind of see in the far right background. And um, what, again, what these are doing is not only cr creating the, the physical structure 
the the hardscape because right now it's it's going to just be sediment and water and nothing in between but you put this physical structure right there that's something that they can start to settle on and the the calcium carbonate of the oyster shells that are in the asphalt uh the concrete is what's going to attract those planktonic larvae to find and settle down and grow and it creates a feedback loop more oysters creates more uh, planktonic larvae creates more uh, again that chemical sensory that there is attracting them and you start to build up what we would call an oyster reef and so this these types of projects are happening i'm sure you've heard in, in other parts of the bay area so we're taking the lessons learned the successes and the failures of all these other organizations that are doing this across the bay and applying them here in the presidio a quarter master reach these are going to be deployed again around november as a small scale pilot study to really start to understand how do we best ma manage these and manipulate these to really maximize the oyster recruitment? Okay, so moving, shifting gears here a little bit, another big part of the job is obviously uh, understanding what is here and how is it doing? Because you need to, in order to conserve something and to manage something, you need to first know about it. And then you need to know how is it doing through time? Because remember the federal mandate is sustain these populations and communities through time. Um, so you need to have information in order to address all of that stuff. So a lot of what we do is and have been doing since the early days of the Presidio becoming a park is uh, inventorying and monitoring. And a lot of those are done through um, not just professionals such as California Academy of Sciences and scientists at San Francisco State University, but we also lean very heavily on community science. So people out and about either intentionally trying to look for these things or just opportunistically finding something they may or may not know about it but they can take a picture of it if it's a good enough picture to identify it, you can post that on something like inaturalist.org and that information is huge um, and of course this is really important we've done been doing this for now 20 plus years so we have a pretty good idea of some of the the more uh, the, we'll say megafauna like the uh, the reptiles and amphibians, the things that are a little easier to find and identify. Uh, but the one thing that we really are lacking is the invertebrates, the obscure, but arguably probably some of the most important components of the ecosystem. These obscure tiny little bees and other in, inverts, insects, um, are incredibly difficult to identify. You have to be a crazy uh, knowledgeable taxonomist in the basement of a museum with a high-powered microscope dissecting their genitalia to get down to species level. Uh, there are not many people like that in the world, um, but we've we've actually have have had some very high success uh, collaborations with some some very um, knowledgeable local enthusiastic volunteers. If anybody knows Ken Schneider, I'm looking at you, Ken Schneider. Ken's been going through and just documenting the diversity of invertebrates, it's just incredible what he's been coming up with and not just what he's been finding and identifying, but also the photography that he's been taking is just mind blowing some of these creatures that are living just just below our noses. Um, and I will say, say that even, even um, in the early days of the Presidio, some of these inventory that we had specifically with bees, we, the Presidio is, is, was, and is continuing to be um, a, a, a sanctuary for bees, the diversity of bees I think uh, last check it was somewhere around 60 confirmed species of bees and there are certainly more species than that that have yet to be confirmed or probably even found in the Presidio because again some of these bees are tiny tiny like this one right here I don't I don't even know what kind of bee that is I took that photograph but um, can't really identify from just the face alone um, so again these tiny obscure invertebrates um, are probably represent the vast majority of biodiversity in the Presidio, uh, you know, excluding the, the microbes and things like that. Um, and this is really kind of the, the, the forefront of understanding the, the species uh, diversity in the Presidio. So we're continuing to inventory and monitor these through time. And again, I encourage you, if you're out and about and you see something, you don't know what it is, take a picture of it and share that on iNaturalist because I scour that, that iNaturalist specifically for the Presidio daily. And the, some of the stuff these, that people are finding is just super incredible. And of course, all of these animals, small or big, play a really important role in the functioning of the ecosystem. As I said, complexity and resilience is really what we're going for. But we need to understand what is there, how we protect it, and how are those doing long-term trends through time. A couple other things we do to monitor trends. Um, of course, uh, monitoring bird diversity is a huge component of this. And uh, we have a variety of approaches to that from 
um, Point Blue Conservation Science contracts. They've been monitoring some of our restoration sites, standardized monitor protocols of uh, the bird community change through time as we restore sites. How does the bird community change as the site establishes and develops? Um, as well as we're developing a community science-based um, area search protocol that we are piloting and we're getting more and more involvement of local birders to help us um, document the, the change of bird avian community through time, standardized so that we can compare through time to look for trends to see if we need to intervene with management actions. And when we can, we actually will apply um, some of our monitoring techniques, we'll, we will apply modern technology such as this camera. I'm sure many of you hopefully saw this uh, feed. It was 2018 now. Um, we have a long, long-term long red tail hawk pair and we were able to share this with the world. They, they successfully reared two uh, beautiful little chicks and we had uh, an international uh, th these, this, these, this red tail family was internationally famous. And these are really cool opportunities, not only to show, to showcase the diversity of the Presidio, but it also allows us to, to, to track, you know, breeding and, and, and fledging success and all of that stuff. Um, you can all, you note it, you can notice, I don't know if you can see my mouse right there, but look at the, this is the mother right here. She's got a band around her leg. So we were able to actually track that. She was banded as a, as a, a first year in the uh, Marin Headlands, the, the Golden Gate Raptor Observatory. So we know um, roughly her age. I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think it was, she was a yearling when they caught her and that was in 2010, around 2010. And she's been at this nest since then or around 2012, I think is our first record. So monitoring the raptors throughout the Presidio is obviously important because again, they provide an ecosystem service. Remember that keyword I was talking about? And you can clearly see it here. I think she's got two rodents right there and one talon. Um, and that just is a huge component. A lot of people don't realize uh, that these predators are benefiting us huge. They're just, it's a huge benefit. The amount of predator, uh, rodents that this mom and the dad were bringing to these two hungry growing chicks, just constantly, constantly gophers and rats and mice and, you know, voles and all of that stuff. A huge important ecosystem service because a lot of people don't like those, especially rats that get into your house. Um, and it's also, this provides a great opportunity to really connect people uh, in their minds uh, why it is really bad to use rodenticides. Because you use rodenticides, it's not going to immediately kill that rat. That rat's going to go outside. It's going to get picked off by a predator like this, this red-tailed hawk. And then that red-tailed hawk is either going to eat it or feed it to its babies. And that rodenticide is going to accumulate and ultimately will um, likely result in mortality. So this is a great opportunity um, to, to share that connection. And a lot of people in the public, they don't make that connection. Uh, they just want those rodents dead. So being able to show them, this is why you don't want to use rodenticide. Um, and we actually do track rodenticide deaths of predators in the Presidio. And sadly, we have confirmed that owls and, and raptors, uh, other raptors have died from rodenticide. It, rodenticides, I will say, are not allowed in the Presidio, but they can be used uh, throughout the rest of the city by private property owners. And some of those rats are getting exposed and coming into the Presidio. Um, so it is happening and more people need to know and more awareness So opportunities like this to show the world. And of course, the Presidio is not locals only. Um, not all the species that come through the Presidio uh, are, live in the Presidio year round. Presidio is a huge resource for migrants. This is a violet green swallow. For those of you who don't know, uh, the violet, violet green swallows, they, they come to the Presidio and, and elsewhere in the Bay Area. They come to the Presidio to breed. They come all the way from Central America. They fly all the way up here to breed. And, and one of the hot spots, if you ever want to see them, um, is the Fort Scott area, just south of the Golden Gate Bridge. Huge open um, prairie with a lot of invertebrates flying around. These uh, aerial acrobats are just loving the, the invertebrates. They're just feasting on these invertebrates in this field and they're building their classic swallow nests up in the old Spanish tiles of the old Fort Scott buildings. And uh, again, they fly long distance just to breed here in the Presidio. So we wanna have the resources so that these long distance migrants can stop and rest and rear their chicks successfully, a new generation, because of the resources that the Presidio, a healthy Presidio will provide them. And so a lot of you have probably seen this, but the, the P Pacific coast, the West coast is, is actually used to navigate for a lot of long distance uh, migrants. Um, and 
of course, the Presidio is, is on the coast and used, again, as a stopping point, whether that be for actually stopping and breeding or just stopping to rest and recharge, refuel, and then keep going on their way. So we really want to be able to provide the fuel, the resources, the food, and the places, the refugia for these, these long-distance migrants um, to actually stop and complete their journey or rear their young. And it's not just birds either, bats, a lot of bats, and not, and not just vertebrates either. It's not, it's not just um, um, all migrants, not all migrants have backbones. So these are, of course, uh, the, the um, monarch butterflies. They come as far as the Rockies to overwinter in the Bay Area. And they, they too need their resources. Uh, and it turns out that they actually uh, really like to overwinter in the eucalyptus trees, right? And so uh, a lot of you probably know the eucalyptus trees are, are actually uh, native to the Australian area, right? So definitely far away from the Presidio. They were brought in by the military and others, but in the Presidio by the military in the late 1800s. Um, and it just so happens that these overwintering monarchs really prefer certain configurations of these eucalyptus stands. It's really incredible. It's, it's, it's totally novel. It, these, these butterflies did not evolve in the presence of these tall eucalyptus plantations. But here we are, 21st century, there's this relationship going on. And as we all know, butterfly, uh, monarch butterflies are just drastically plummeting right now. So we want to do the best we can do to provide them the overwintering habitat that they need to continue their life cycle and their generations. And so we work with some, some, some folks, some monarch experts to really assess our forests in the Presidio. And I'll just step aside and say that uh, I know eucalyptus trees can be very controversial, uh, but part of the federal mandate of this national park is the historic character. And these eucalyptus in some areas of the Presidio are designated historically uh, protected. So we, we have to manage, the Presidio Trust has to manage the historic character of these eucalyptus forests indefinitely. So we manage them, but so we just we have to recognize that these are these trees are here to stay, but also recognize that they can serve some habitat value for wildlife. So we actually work on actively managing these forests to improve not just for overwintering um, habitat for monarch butterflies, which really kind of boils down to selective uh, thinning of the forest. These butterflies like dapple sunlight. They like the microclimate so they can thermoregulate, go from sunny areas to shady areas when they need to. Um, but also these butterflies need nectar sources and eucalyptus plantations or groves uh, are notorious for having very low diversity in the understory. One of our novel projects that we've been working on in the Presidio is really challenging this idea that eucalyptus trees are barren wastelands. And so what we've been doing is going into the understory in some of these areas and clearing them out of the mostly ivy, that's generally what is, you find down there, um, and finding and experimenting with a palette of native plants that are shade tolerant. And we've actually been, been finding some success with some really great thriving native plants, um, such as uh, um, elderberry and uh, California bee plant, and, and a, a number of other shade tolerant plants. We're actually finding some high success rates of this um, novel understory diversification approach, which again is gonna be the, some of the nectar, uh, not just for these overwintering butterflies, but also um, the many other wildlife species that are using these, these forests. So again, recognizing these forests are here to stay, but they, they can have some habitat value, especially if we have some, some very thoughtful approach to uh, managing and uh, management strategies to these forests. Okay, so now for the, the, the tasty, exciting part, one of my favorite uh, concepts, um, reintroductions. So I just want to define this because there are a lot of definitions floating around, but it's the intentional movement and release of an organism inside its indigenous range from which it disappeared. As I mentioned in the beginning of this talk, a lot of species disappeared from the Presidio and San Francisco because of loss of habitat or habitat degradation. And so we want to understand what was here and, and we do that through the priceless specimens that museums like California Academy of Sciences hold in their collections, um, you know, collected a, a hundred plus years ago and stored in a bottle of alcohol, forgotten somewhere on a shelf. Uh, that's it. That's it. We found it. There it is. That's proof that this species once occurred here. So understanding what was here, really understanding why was that species or these species, why did they go locally extinct? Um, and has 
the driver of local extinction, AKA extirpation, has the driver of local extinction been addressed? If so, can this species come back on its own? And if not, can we then bring it back? Can we intervene and physically find the animal somewhere else and move it into the Presidio, into this newly restored habitat? Um, and there are many reasons why we'd want to reintroduce uh, species, specifically wildlife. Uh, we, again, want to restore checks and balances, so ecosystem complexity and resilience, uh, and, and fill the, these lost niches of these lost species. Um, again, some of these species have specific ecosystem services that can directly benefit and improve our human health uh, here in the city. And, and of course, uh, the inspiration. A lot of these charismatic animals that I'm going to talk about next uh, can be hugely inspiring for all types of different people, all types of generations of people, um, and really bringing conservation action to our urban audience. Again, a lot of conservation action is so far away, far removed, you know, pristine areas that nobody in urban areas hardly is ever going to get an opportunity to go and check that out. So bringing the conservation action here into the city to show and share these stories. So I'm going to go through some of these examples right now of things that we have been working on. Um, and the first one I want to talk about and highlight is the variable checker spot. Uh, this butterfly was last seen in the Presidio in the late 1970s. And why was it lost? Well, again, the general pattern of habitat degradation and the primarily, again, for butterflies, host plant is very important. The host plant for this species is the California bee plant, uh, the sticky monkey flower, and a couple of other things that are closely related to those species of plants. But uh, primarily California bee plant, and we know, again, the Presidio landscape just underwent a huge change, and uh, a lot of the habitat of the species uh, just was gone. And so, again, over 20 plus years of restoration through volunteering and our, our planting of these host plants, this the coastal scrub of the Presidio is prime time for this butterfly is a huge missing component. But turns out this even though this animal flies, it is a lazy flyer. It is uh, not the type of butterfly that like a monarch that can fly hundreds of miles. This thing is a low flyer. It's very lazy. There's no way it could ever cross uh, the bay. There's no way it could cross through the concrete jungle that is San Francisco. The closest population, there is a small population in Laguna Honda, which is in the center of the city, but even that is way too disconnected for the Presidio. So 2017, we actually took it upon ourselves to actually go to San Bruno Mountain, collect the caterpillars of this, this butterfly and put them, put them like, pick them up off bee plant, put them, take them to the Presidio and put them on bee plant. And just, it was so satisfying to see them just immediately start to munch away at this bee plant. Um, and we did that for, we did two years of translocations of, of um, caterpillars across two different sites of the Presidio. And here's uh, some of our monitoring results through time. You can see 2006 on the, on the left. So the, the X axis is the year. The Y axis is the estimate counts based on our, off our transect um, walks and counting and extrapolating that out to the full acreage of the site that we released them at, going from zero in 2016 before the reintroduction up into 2019, the estimate of, uh, again, over a thousand individuals um, in just one little small site. So that's, that's one way to look at it. And then here's another really cool way to uh, look at it spatially. So this is the Presidio. It's a little blown out, I can tell, but these are just observations that people, the community, were sharing with us on iNaturalist. And you can see our two release sites right here. And just watch through time. This is 2007, the first flight season. 2008, look how they're spreading. 2019, um, see, how, see how much they spread? That's exactly what we want to see. We want to see higher numbers, and we want to see them spreading throughout the habitat of the Presidio, the, the, the specific coastal scrub habitat. And so look at that left side of the screen down there on the, in that, the left side cluster. That's this side of the park. And if you can see my mouse, that coastal scrub area, that's Lobos Valley right there. Just behind this big hospital building right there, that's that that open area is what we call Presidio Hills. That was the core release site, and they started to spread down on their own through Lobos Valley, which again, Lobos Valley was one of the original restoration sites, and they began to spread um, across this other um, network of patches of coastal scrub. And hopefully, through time, they'll bust out over to the coastal bluffs. Coastal bluffs is coastal scrub all the way up to Four Points. So, just a matter of time, they are spreading, and they will continue to thrive. 
I want to use this picture right here as a nice transition as well because another story I want to tell is to the right hand lower corner that lake down there right next to highway one right there that's mountain lake it's a uh, 2000 year old lake um, the original European uh, founders of Yerba Buena that is where they ended their journey up from Mexico and founded El Presidio founded Yerba Buena right on that lake that water body was the resource the reason why they stopped here in the Presidio and founded the fort. Presidio was Spanish for fort. Um, and it really, it's, it's an incredibly rare habitat in urban areas. Um, but as we all know, urban lakes and ponds are notorious for being cesspools. And that was, um, Mountain Lake was no exception. So when the Presidio inherited Mountain Lake, um, this is essentially what they inherited, a cesspool. It was, it was a totally out of whack completely unhealthy the checks and balances were just bleh, all over the place had crazy fish die-offs every year resulting from uh, nasty algae blooms algae blooms will, will will totally dissolve the oxygen in the water resulting in the, the death of a lot of the fish those fish were decomposing we had mosquito outbreaks it was a disaster and of course the presidio trust um wanted to fix that That's part of it let's restore this this is a a, a neighborhood gem this is a gem of the, the ggnra uh let's let's do something about this so we we, we got together with a bunch of people and decided to um, come up with some goals and this is a artistic rendition of um kind of the idealized um the idealized uh res restoration um, and our goals in short are increased biodiversity improve water quality and promote community engagement, tell the stories of this. Of course, all of those goals are very much intertwined. And um, this is a really complex system. And this is really an, uh, an example of a holistic approach, a whole scale restoration. So I'm gonna focus on the wildlife, but this also involves uh, a number of n addressing a lot of issues that are uh, vegetation related or even non-living. And, and here's a couple of those. So I'll start in the top left corner. You can see the lake. This is a photo from the 1930s. Uh, that golf course right there, just uphill of that lake, was built in the late 1800s. Golf courses like to use fertilizers to keep their greens green. And of course, if it's uphill, what happens when it rains? It all goes into the lake. So that's a huge source of nutrients. And nutrients fuel algae blooms. And algae blooms fuel all kinds of problems. So addressing the the point source runoff of the nutrients from the golf course was number one we had to deal with that below that you can see the highway that's a picture of the highway right there on the bottom left um hi, the highway resulted in um contaminants associated with automobiles like lead from gasoline getting into the lake resulting in just skyrocketing way beyond thresholds of environmental and public safety of lead contamination so we had to dredge the lake and you can see that barge in there 2013 we dredged the lake remediate the lake remove the, the lead um, to clean out that contamination from the highway and then of course the, the the trifecta of habitat degradation is the invasive species and that's primarily um, people's unwanted pets like those red-eared sliders very popular in pet stores but not very fun to have in your little apartment when they get really big and smelly so you people want to liberate them into the nearest water body thinking they're doing good in fact they're actually doing really uh, detrimenting uh, not just um, you know maybe one or two turtles but an entire community of turtles and plants and frogs and fish etc and then of course the fish themselves the number one uh, culprit being the the common carp um, carp are notorious worldwide for for um, not only environmental damage but also um, ec um, um, economic damage um, they, they just stir up the water constantly creating chocolate milk turbid water which turbid water just everything starts to collapse from there because the underwater aquatic vegetation needs clear water they ne it needs sunlight to thrive aquatic vegetation is the foundation of the ecosystem think dissolved oxygen um, so addressing these problems allowed us to start to uh, actually talk about rebuilding and restoring the the vibrant community of wildlife that was once there. So going through some of the wildlife species that we've been restoring and reintroducing, this is the Western pond turtle, uh, the only native aquatic turtle in California, becoming more and more rare. Uh, this was heavily harvested at Mountain Lake and the Bay Area during the gold rush. It was very popular in the meat market during those times. Um, and of course, the introduction of the invasive radiator slider outcompete these turtles, also introduced disease. So at some point, in probably the 20th century we're not exactly sure exactly when this this 
species of turtle uh, blinked out at Mountain Lake. So um, we started a collaborative project with San Francisco Zoo and uh, they Head Start program um, and released around 55 several years ago and we're monitoring that population. They are just getting to the size of sexual reproduction. So we haven't seen breeding yet, but we hope to see breeding successfully happening in the lake. Because again, you don't have a successful sustainable population unless you have successful breeding and recruitment of a new generation. Another one is the, the, the chorus frog, Pacific chorus frog, once on the verge of extinction in San Francisco, but thanks to habitat restoration, we were able to reverse that trend of decline. And now these uh, chorus frogs are not only thriving in Mountain Lake, but they're thriving throughout the Presidio where we've restored other wetland habitat. Um, the only known native fish species to have been documented in Mountain Lake is the three-spined stickleback. And it's an uh, interesting fish because it, it's, it's very common throughout the Northern Hemisphere, but it's interesting because they actually live in the bay. They're, they're, they're a marine fish and they can actually swim up creeks like Lobos Creek, for example, from Baker Beach. And at some point in the 2000 year history of Mountain Lake, they, they found their way into Mountain Lake and they became established and then they blinked out because again, habitat degradation and all of that stuff. So we, uh, um, we re translocated from Lobos Creek about a thousand and, and, and since then they've been thriving. Um, they're an incredibly important part of the food chain. Of course, they're food for um, a lot of the native wildlife, including birds and things like that. But uh, another important role that they play for us humans is their predation on mosquitoes. That was a big concern of the restoration of Mountain Lake. Hey, if you're gonna, if you're gonna remove all the invasive fish species, including mosquito fish, which are voracious predators on native amphibians, you're gonna have a mosquito problem on your hand. Well, that's why we wanna restore some of the native predators as well, because those native predators will help us control issues like mosquitoes. And since, since then, we have not had complaints of mosquito um, problems at this lake, which is great. And this is one of my favorite animals. This is the California floater mussel. And I know what you're thinking. Yes, this is the most charismatic animal you have ever seen. But no, they are not like uh, the marine mussels that you see attached to rocks in the intertidal zone. They are not like the oysters or those mus marine mussels, like how they physically attach and they will not move from those rocks. These are actually um, free living animals that live in the sediment. They're fairly large, as you can see here. They actually get bigger than this. And um, they're very rare in California and becoming more rare because of their sensitivity to water quality. And of course, water quality generally is on the decline, unfortunately. And they, not only are they rare, but they're incredibly bizarre. They're actually parasites of fish. They require a host fish like the three spine stickleback to complete their life cycle. On their left, you see the uh, glaucidia, the larvae of this. Uh, they, they're, they're brooded in the, the gills of the female when a three-spine stickleback or another host fish species comes by. The female will spit them out. They clamp down, absorb nutrients from the gills and the fins of the fish before finally dropping off. So if you don't have the, a, a host fish present like the mosquito, um, the three-spine stickleback, you cannot have a sustainable population of these mussels. So in order to establish these mussels, we first have to establish the three-spine stickleback, which is what we did. Not only are they important for, or just, just really bizarre and weird, but they also serve an incredibly important functional role. And that is through their uh, feeding. They, these animals are filter feeders. They're constantly sucking in water and pulling out all the little particulate matters that create uh, the turbidity in water, like, uh, like um, uh, phytoplankton, for example, algae. And you can see a great example here on the left, absence of mussels on the right. Uh, presence of mussels, constantly filtering the water, little biological filters. So again, one of our goals of restoring this lake is to improve water quality. These mussels are, that's what they're, that, that is perfect for that. And not only do they just improve water clarity, but even more interesting and important and relevant is we, uh, one of our um, collaborators with Stanford University, some environmental engineer PhD students, they actually were able to quantify at Mountain Lake with these mussels in the lake water that these mussels actually remove E. coli from the water. And we have E. coli in Mountain Lake. Uh, urban water bodies have tend to have E. coli problems. You, you can use, you can harness the filtration of these mussels. If you get high enough numbers, you can actually have an impact in reducing E. coli. Um, and um, one more species that we've been working on. Uh, this is the rarest damselfly in North America. This is a San Francisco fork-tailed damselfly. It's only found in the Bay Area and only in a handful of places. And it is, it is on its way out. It is on its way out 
to extinction just because it's becoming more and more rare. There's one population in the Presidio, it's right by Fort Point, literally a stone's throw away from the bay on those king tides that we have. That, that salt water can really impact this species of um, wetland obligate. So for those of you who don't know damselflies, this is basically a small dragonfly. And we've been working with San Francisco Zoo on a, a captive rearing program with this species. So for those of you who don't know, the, the, the life cycle of these insects are really interesting. And the juvenile stage, the nymph stage, the naiad stage, which we see here, is fully aquatic. Those two tails sticking off its, of its little abdomen, those are actually gills. It requires fresh water. If you don't have fresh water, you're not going to have damselflies. Um, and again, like I said, the Fort Point population is doomed because of um, this, the bay saltwater coming into it. So captive breeding at San Francisco Zoo is resulting in thousands and thousands of these naiads, taking these naiads and releasing them in areas of mountain lake and other restored wetlands throughout the Presidio. Um, and we're starting to see some success at some of these wetlands. It's a, it's a challenging project, but we are starting to see some success. And another reason why we love damselflies is because they are voracious predators, not just as adults, but as the naiads, the, the aquatic stage, love to eat things like mosquitoes. Um, so these little guys, they are our friends. Okay, so just to close it out, again, the, the whole purpose of this, as I said, is um, bringing conservation action to an urban audience. The human dimension is arguably the most important part of all of this work that we're doing. Um, and so specifically for Mountain Lake, we set a goal uh, to, to actually reach 10,000 community members telling these stories uh, throughout the communities that we bring out to field trips and educational events and all of that stuff. We had a goal of reaching 10,000 people sharing these stories in five years. And in February 2019, we blew way past that 10,000 um, 10, K goal. And we're continuing to do so. Obviously, current lockdown situation has put a little hamper on that other than opportunities like this. Um, but we're still doing that. And one of the things that we're working on is really, it's called social marketing. It's really a, 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 an approach that a lot of people are using uh, to foster behavioral change. So telling these stories and, and, and we're at, we ask people to pledge um, or to promise that, you know, they won't feed the wildlife. You know, all of these things are explained to these tours, why feeding wildlife is bad, why you want to pick up after your pets, um, why you don't want to abandon your pets and sharing this knowledge, spreading this knowledge, um, all of these wildlife species that we work with are opportunities for engagement and, and using charismatic creatures like this turtle or our ambassador species or as we also like to call them gateway species everybody loves baby turtles uh, mm, people might not care about annelid worms or zooplankton or plants for that matter but when you engage them with a charismatic turtle and you tell the story and you connect it to all these other obscure things from annelids to zooplanktons, you can really make that connection to these, these people. Um, so using these gateway, these gateway charismatic animals to share these stories. Uh, this is uh, some froglets that we were releasing, uh, hugely popular with all age class of people. People love little frogs. Um, bringing conservation action to this urban audience. Um, this is the zoo crew. These are the interns at the zoo who are the future generations of conservation, getting them involved. These, these kids come out and help us, you know, manage vegetation. We, we love, allow them to work with our wildlife management team and all of that stuff. So again, huge opportunities here. People love animals, especially animals with big eyes. They love them. Um, great way to engage people. And just kind of to wrap up, uh, as I said, we're in a biodiversity hotspot, but a lot of that biodiversity is either totally declining and on its way out or has already blinked out. And this is just a, a small example of the wildlife species that we know used to occur in the Presidio based on the museum and written records that we've been able to dig up um, at places like Cal Academy. And so all of these different species represent opportunities, uh, opportunities to improve the, the complexities of the ecosystem, the resiliency, uh, the, the health and the function, provide different potential ecosystem services that will improve our lives directly. Um, we're working on some of these right now, uh, and some of these other ones are, um, you know, long-term goals that we're we're really considering. And this is just the, the tip of the iceberg, but some of the some of the more obvious ones: big eyes, furry things, uh, fluttery, colorful things. People, that's 
you know, people latch on to that. And again, connecting people through these gateway animals to really get them to understand some of the more uh, complex and, and maybe seemingly on face value uninteresting things. Um, so then just to, just to wrap up uh, and recap, why is this important? Again, ecosystem resilience, especially in this time of change that we're undergoing right now, complexity, increasing these checks and balances is gonna, is gonna, is gonna allow us to sustain these communities, th ecosystem services, um, wildlife communities through time. And of course, ecosystem services can very importantly impact our lives directly. Clean water, um, pest control, you know, clean air, things like that. Um, sense of place, I didn't get into that too much, but the, the idea is very simple. Uh, we're in a very unique area, a very, again, hotspot for biodiversity that's very unique to this area. And to be in an area where you grew up and you know you can identify these different species that are a combination of species found nowhere else in the world, that is the sense of place, what it is to be in the Presidio of San Francisco. And of course, all of this ties into our mental and physical health. And, and COVID lockdowns and being stuck inside because of air quality because the fires is, is it only underscores the importance 10 times what we were already aware of in this group before all of that stuff happened having access to this to just you know long day after work to go walk down a trail and to see a crab spider that's mating with another the small male crab spider while eating a robber fly on a poppy i mean you can't beat that <laughs> um so again ins inspiring connectedness passing that on to the next generation we have a choice <laughs> our, our our urban areas can look like this uh you know dystopian collapse or we can have more integration more thoughtful approaches to a 21st century uh urban area and so that's kind of where we are in this new beginning phases of uh urban ecology in the 21st century in the presidio we're learning these lessons whether they're successes or failures and we hope to apply those and share those outside to other areas whether that be in san francisco or beyond across the planet um, you know it's our choice what do we want and so with that i'm going to end there and uh, thanks for sticking around and we'll take some questions now thank you all right yay that was really beautiful and inspiring jonathan thank you thanks so much i mean yeah. people are uh there, there's, there's some questions and a lot of thank yous and bravos and uh, uh, there's, I don't know if you want to just look at the Q and A. Yeah, I'll pull them up. Or, um, but uh, one, one question I had was, um, so the the fish that you were holding up in the slide of Mountain Lake, the invasive fish, one was a carp and the other one was a. It was a sturgeon. Sturgeon, right. So yeah. which one tastes better? <laughs> well, carp were actually spread around the world in the 1800s as the idea was, hey, let's, they're from the your, um, Caspian Sea, Eurasia area. Yeah. And in that area, they're, they're a common food source. So the thought was, let's spread them around the world as a food source for everybody. But it turns out uh, a lot of the Western cultures do not like carp. Um, so uh, they just they became an invasive species for food and it just didn't pan out that way um but they the smell of carp there's a very distinct smell and i've smelled so many of them from that work that i can't i can't go there i'm sure yeah i've, I've never eaten carp that i'm aware of at least if i had to i guess i would but so yeah. i would probably say caviar from sturgeon even though i've never had it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was only teasing yeah, you yeah, yeah. Anyway, really but uh but there are some really good questions in here and one of them uh that kind of is a very easy one is um what's the water source for mountain lake because it's it's, uh, it's oh. a spring fed from from the groundwater underwater ground um so it's uh yeah the groundwater table cool Right um, so, I, Eddie, do you want to ask or do you want me to just go through and ask them? Yeah, you can just go through. It'd probably be more efficient. Yeah, so why is water quality on the decline generally? Um, it's, you know, agricultural runoff, damming, um, uh, erosion problems, um, general contaminants. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, chemicals sprayed in the Central Valley can blow over and settle down in watersheds. Um, you know, it's a very complex thing. And that's why I said just generally the trend of water quality generally is, is on the decline. 
um, especially in urban areas. I mean, urban areas are not on the decline, they're just generally just bad water quality. Um, next question. Have you considered reintroducing the California quail in the Presidio? Yeah, uh, we are considering that. We're strongly considering that. We're actually in the very, 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 very early stages at understanding what it would take to restore the California quail. So we're working with the um, uh, SF Bay Estuary Institute, um, SFEI. Yeah, that's right, SFEI. Look them up, they're great. And we're working with them to understand um, using population models and things like that. Um, could quail, now that we've restored the habitat, could they survive in the Presidio? Um, so it's, it's, it's a, a long-term project. So we're not there yet, but we are talking about it. Um, has there been any word lately on SF garter snakes? Um, so as far as I know, SF garter snakes never really occurred in the Presidio. We don't have any records of them. Um, and as far as I know, again, this doesn't really mean much, but the county line of San, San, San Francisco, um, I believe the only collections that we know of are actually south of San Francisco County line. Um, I'm sure at some point in the past, there were SF garter snakes crossing the county line, which is just some arbitrary line. Um, so uh, at the moment, no, there's, there's no potential for restoring SF garter snakes, which is a federally endangered species protected by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service and the Endangered Species Act. So, um, but they are on the peninsula. Uh, what can people do in their own backyards to support these goals? Um, I'm sure California Native Plant Society has a lot of information on that, but uh, starting with, again, planting native plants, providing resources um, for, for a lot of pollinators and things like that is, is huge. Don't use rodenticides. Um, and you know, when we get back online, come out and volunteer. You can learn a lot of techniques that you can then apply in your own backyard. Um, uh, what's the coyote and crow doing in this photo? That's not a coyote, that is a gray fox. It ran up the tree. Gray fox are uh, one of the only canids that can climb trees. And I was following a coyote one day and I saw it chase something up a tree. And I looked up and I saw a gray fox and gray fox had not been seen in the Presidio in over a decade. Uh, so it was running away from a coyote. That's what that gray fox was doing. And that's Land's End you can see in the background over there. Um, the lead in Mountain Lake was removed from a dredge. It was basically an underwater vacuum cleaner. Uh, Fighter remediation. Uh, yeah, that, I didn't talk about it because I don't have too much time, but we are trying to restore the submerged aquatic vegetation to Mountain Lake. Uh, the genus of one species being Stachenia, uh, Sago pondweed is the common name. And those are notorious for sequestering uh, legacy nutrients. Not so much for remediating necessarily, but for, for restoring and, and removing uh, nutrients. But they wouldn't uh, sequester things like lead or things like that. Um, to what extent are the biodiversity advances in the Presidio self-sustaining? What would happen if positive intervention ceased? Well, that's a great question. Management, natural resource management will never end. You can never walk away. Um, it's always gonna require some management um, on some level. Some things actually can become self-sufficient, um, but, but a lot of natural resource management ecosystems are so complex, more complex than our feeble little primate brains could ever truly understand. Um, but but there's always going to be management nudging the trajectory towards our goals. Whatever our societal goals are uh, for the ecosystem, we need to manage constantly towards that direction. So, but some things uh, like the checker spot butterfly seems to be fully self-sufficient at this point. We could walk away. We don't have to relocate, translocate any more caterpillars, but we do want to make sure that our host plants stay thriving. And if, if uh, an invasive ivy covers those host plants, we could lose those host plants like we did before. So we need to manage that invasive ivy. Um, it's just trying to go through, I'm doing a time check here. It's getting kind of late. So I'm just gonna, uh, someone asked about coyotes and I, you notice I didn't mention coyotes in here other than talking about this gray fox here. Uh, that's a whole nother story and maybe CMPS will invite me back sometime to give a, a coyote talk, um, but it's a whole long complicated story that uh, would take an hour plus to talk about. So I appreciate your curiosity um, and um, coyotes are here and we manage them and there's some interesting things happening. Um, are you taking climate change projections into account in managing decisions? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, off the top of my head, one of those examples would be um, oysters. 
how is climate change going to change, for example, the salinity of the bay or the um, the uh, pH of the bay? Because because um, pH really impacts their their shell development. Um, seasonal wetlands. How is climate change? Well, you all know we've every year seems for the last five years have been serious droughts. Some of our seasonal wetlands this year didn't even have a chance to let the frogs breed. It was like a total loss of a breeding season for these frogs just because of lack of rain. So yes, we are actually, it's a very complicated thing, obviously, but we are looking at that. Uh, is it true that someone released a pet alligator into Mountain Lake before restoration? Yes, ah, the famed golden gator. It was actually a caiman in the 90s, but uh, uh, yes, it was removed uh, and it was relocated to Florida. Um, lived happily ever after in Florida. But every time I'm in Mountain Lake swimming around, which is not often, and I don't recommend it, I only do it for management purposes, uh, but every time I'm doing it, I cannot help but think that there might still be an alligator in there. It's a little creepy. Um, yeah, so that's, mm, uh, somebody asked Presidio at Lincoln Boulevard and Halleck Street, there's a big planting project going on. What is being planted? Are they eucalyptus or something else? Were you consulted as to what would be good for wildlife? Do they ever ask you when they're planting or reap? Um, Lincoln and Halleck, I think the area that you're referring to is more of a landscaped area. That's close to the Daylight Creek that I showed. It's also close to the Quartermaster Reach. So there's a lot of different types of planting happening in that area. Um, there's a lot of uh, cultural landscaped areas that are uh, histor historically managed to, uh, again, maintain historic character. Um, but yeah, we do we do a lot of con collaboration and we actually had a cool research project with a graduate student from SF State to look at our cultural landscape uh, the plant palettes that we use and she assessed which of these plants that we use that are mostly all non-native generally which one of these are actually the best for our native pollinators so using those results which the results are still pending because that was a recent project using those to inform our planting palettes for these cultural landscapes is one way to help us improve these resources for uh, biodiversity in the non uh, in the the non wild area of the presidio um yeah so i think that's mostly all of the questions um so a lot of thank yous you're welcome <laughs> it's great to <laughs> get encouragement from people because um sometimes natural resource management as i'm sure a lot of you know can be very controversial um, so it's always good to get positive reinforcement. Um, here's one. Is there any organized way of getting information of what private SF gardeners should be doing to support reintroduction ecology work you do in the Presidio, for example? Please plant more coast buckwheat and you can get one per household for free at Presidio Nursery even, as an example, because no, currently you cannot get a free plant at the Presidio Nursery. Maybe in the future it will go that way. Um, but it looks like CMPS has the answer to that. And I will let somebody at California Plant Society answer that because I know you have the answer to that. Yeah, it's a, a, it's a lot about where your garden is. So uh, because San Francisco Peninsula has amazingly diverse uh, climate and uh, even soil types. So uh, we, we sort of need to know like where where the uh, plot or garden is before we can give best information. But if you contact us at, uh, at our website, cnps-urbavuena.org, uh, and there's a place where you can just send us a message and uh, we'd love to share information. Jonathan, I have a question about the dune bee that came back. Why did mm -hmm. it come back? Like what happened in that? What's that story? What did it, what was missing and what happened? Uh, what did it like when it came back? Yeah, so uh, Bob's referring to uh, uh, last year, maybe two years ago, we had some uh, media buzz, pun intended, media buzz around um, this uh, dune obligate bee species that was, is very rare, fairly rare. Um, it's a dune obligate. It requires open dune sand to to dig its nest and lay its eggs, and um, so we we, we actually the, those 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 bees occurred in the Presidio before. We had a re a recent record this century from like 2001 
of one individual in the Presidio. So we knew that they were there, but the really cool thing about these bees is when they come out in their little short flight window during the season, breeding season in spring, they come out in masses. And the males come out first and they just fly really close to the ground and they wait for the females to emerge. And when the females emerge, they, they create these mating balls, just a huge, really bizarre, crazy thing going on. Um, so we had never seen it like that on that level and, and just for your information everybody those are called silver digger bees latin hapropotus miserables so you can look them up they're they're pretty interesting um, but as we restored one site in particular rob hill dunes um, there must have been a source nearby somewhere there was probably closer to the baker beach side of things that has found itself again if you build it they will come which is what happened here they found established over the years and two years ago we just you couldn't not notice them walking around the site. There were so many of them buzzing around. It was just a roar of buzz. Um, so that was really cool to see that, really gratifying to see that. Again, the, the mantra of restoration ecology is if you build it, they will come generally. All right, well, Jonathan, we'll, we'll let you go. That was really wonderful. And uh, yeah, so no great to see you and hear, hear you again. Hopefully it'll be Hopefully we'll be together in person at some point in our near future. Yeah, and once uh, volunteering continues again in the Presidio, I encourage anybody who's interested, come on out and get dirty. Uh, a lot of cool stuff, a lot of cool people, a lot of good things to learn, a lot of cool secret hidden spots in the Presidio you may have never known about. Yeah, man. All right, have a good Thanks, night, bro. everyone. Thank you. Thank you.